All right, so it's Saturday late afternoon and um, I'm at another corporate office park. Uh, this time I am off of the Schuylkill Expressway in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia where it's about half an hour from my house. And um, I'm at the John Templeton Foundation. And the reason that I'm here um, is sort of a, a bit of a rabbit hole I've gone down over the past week after I found an old, two old video clips of um, sort of an art project, a conceptual project, to me it seems like potentially a, an esoteric imprinting project, uh, related to the creation of a digital flower currency by uh, Ian Grigg and some other folks in Amstetten, um, Austria, outside of Vienna in 2005-2006. And um, as part of that uh, uh, program, essentially what they did was they gathered pressed flowers uh, in the spring of 2005 and then in the fall of 2006 they met again and they talked about laminating these pressed flowers and turning them into an alternative currency system for sort of art projects. And what was particularly notable was they, they met in a cafe called Cafe, in English it translates to cuckoo, <laughs> and uh, they laid out the flowers that they had pressed on a newspaper article. And this newspaper article, this is an English version. Um, it was from Die Zeit, which is a German newspaper. I, I saved it and printed it out. And it's called Money Teaches Prayer. And essentially it was talking about the intersection of social values and money and religion. And it was talking about the John Templeton Foundation. So interesting, right? And you know, I had first come across the John Templeton Foundation Oh, probably like in 2016 or 2017 when I was doing my education research, in part uh, because I was looking into Angela Duckworth, who is a, uh, a professor at Penn who's associated with a number of part divisions of the university, including the Positive Psychology Center that's led by Martin Seligman. And um, she was sort of doing a bunch of research in my child's school, which is a magnet school in Philadelphia, a public magnet school in Philadelphia. And she also ran something called the Character Lab at Penn. Um, you know, and at the time I was still really naive and I sort of presumed that character was about like one's values system or something like that, um, as opposed to an avatar. But now I realize it's probably very much uh, double, double meaning there. And, um, and she was getting funding from the Templeton Foundation. And, and later she actually uh, was getting money from Chan Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan's foundation too. So they were looking at um, sort of measuring and quantifying uh, social behaviors, which as we know is something that's going to be commodified as, as global tokenized markets. And um, so I was looking at the Templeton Foundation and I was pretty shocked because I hadn't spent a lot of time really looking, looking into the idea of eugenics. This was way before any of the lockdown stuff or the health stuff. I was really still focused mostly on education and I hadn't like honestly the eugenics unless it's like your key issue it's not something that people think about today for the most part which is a problem because all of the synthetic biology is ultimately going to be linked to this human plus optimization that's coming. Um, but I was looking at the giving areas and the Templeton, John Templeton Foundation, they actually have three foundations but the, the one there's one that's focused on religion um, and then I guess, I'm not sure if it's the main foundation, but there were a number of giving areas, including genius, so genius, uh, planned reproduction, um, uh, character education, uh, free market economics, uh, religion, and theoretical physics. Those were some of the giving areas. And I thought that was a really interesting combination. And I didn't really know what to make of it fully, other than like I felt like I wasn't super comfortable with anyone dictating what character education was, as if like who gets to decide what being a good human actually is. Like I think there's some com commonalities that we all agree on, but like maybe we don't all agree on what it means for each of us to be good um, in, in certain social constructs. And, um, and then also, yeah, I didn't understand how the free markets and um, sort of genetics might play into this. I didn't understand yet about sort of gamified computational biology um, and swarm intelligence. So none of those things, you know, I was still like five more years down the road before I even knew that those are things I should be paying attention to. Um, so nevertheless, the John Templeton Foundation was really interesting to me. And then essentially I'm looking at this video, um, this is four minute long video where they're taking these pressed flowers, they're talking about laminating them. And that feels very much like, um, 
Neil Stevenson's new effort, Laminar One, uh, which is lamination or on a surface level, but also early on, like John Dee was using lamina as, as sort of um, amulets or imprintings to cast spells um, or set sort of energetic intentions. So this, the laminated aspect was interesting. And then also talking about like social values attached to currency. And, and I can see, and this is something I hope to write up soon, but that sort of the, the Anne Rand make a lot of money for yourself and be selfish trope and possibly be you know inappropriate in terms of these nfts and crass and all of that aspect and be a ponzi scheme and be a scammer all of that is being set up not to undo web 3 but to actually shift it over into this collective phase this collective um tokenized participatory governance for social good for the blockchain that all of it's still going to be on the blockchain only the, the next phase they're going to say no 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 we're not going to do all those scammer things that we used to do we're going to do use the tokens but we're going to use them for the good stuff for democracy and for participation and for social good and and everybody has to behave everybody has to be good because we've all got you on blockchain with your digital identity so you're all on notice like we're all in the the token behavior economy now and um so i thought and, and this is not so far off. So I, I made a bit of a video, uh, six minute video today, just kind of thinking about some of the, the, the encodings in this, just this six minutes of video from 20, 2005. Um, but when he, he was talking about making money beautiful and that the flowers were beautiful and that money should be beautiful. And he lifted up one of these uh, $50 peso notes, which at the time it was uh, this gentleman, Jose Maria Morales, who um, was a leader in the Mexican independence movement um, and a Catholic priest. And it turns out that after his, um, his, the, his, the town that he was born in was renamed Morelia. Well, we, we know some certain freedom cell interest groups that are based currently out of Morelia, which is very interesting because it also happens to be a center for um, astrophysics and uh, compu like high level quantum computation and a lot of interesting mathematical things at their university there, um, as well as having a, a, a very significant um, 18th century aqueduct, stone aqueduct. So that was all kind of interesting to me. Um, but last year, this uh, $50 peso uh, bill uh, with um, uh, um, Morales on it was replaced by a bill with the axolotl, which is a very unusual salamander that only lives in the lake south of Mexico City. And it was actually the subject of research by Julian Huxley early in his career in terms of metamorphosis and moving things along um, with manipulating the thyroid. And the thyroid itself is a, has been um, a lot of the early radioisotope research was around thyroid function and radio radioactive iodine. So. And, and Julian Huxley, at, around the time in the, in the mid-1920s, was helping establish the biology department at Rice University in, in Houston, Texas, which is currently a center of nanotechnology and biotechnology and synthetic biology. So it's all quite interesting that they're interested in this beautiful money that they, they, they chose this new um, uh, creature for their money, which is the salamander of metamorphosis. And uh, the beautiful money trope is something that's coming through a uh, cello. Uh, and which is one of these programmable digital currencies. And, and I've, I've written a blog post before about uh, the fact that Mexico was being used as a test bed in the 90s for uh, conditional cash transfers. And those conditional cash transfers were related to um, low income women and their children and their behaviors around health and education and work. But they were ex ex essentially expanded all over the world and it's going to go hand in hand with the blockchain currency. And so when they're talking about beautiful money that can be used for social good and social values, I think what they're saying is that they're going to tokenize human portfolios, um, which is something Global Education Futures and Pavel Lecture have been talking about since 2012, a people near, someone who owns a massive portfolio of human capital, and they're going to use that to, to back their beautiful money, their beautiful currency. Um, and it turns out the axolotl bill, everyone just loved it so much uh, that it won like the most beautiful banknote um, of that year. And everyone said, it's so pretty, like it's almost too pretty to spend. We should just frame it and put it on the wall. Um, so all of that narrative building is, is quite interesting to me. So 
Yeah, so I've just been like really mind boggled over this flower currency, what it means with Ian Grigg, uh, his participation in this crypto skeptic conference that was led by Stephen Deal uh, in a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks ago. And the fact that uh, none of them very, very, very lightly touched on Web3 or any pot potential nefarious purposes of living in a blockchain web augmented immersive reality video game. Um, that really wasn't a focus at all, but Grig has been very deeply involved in digital identity and uh, smart contracts and including something called a Ricardian contracts, which are a legally enforced smart, uh, smart contracts that would be tied to bond issu issuances and these alternative currencies back into the mid 1990s. Um, and he was connected with another gentleman who was promoting something called this like geodesic economy. So very alternative currencies where, yeah, maybe you could have flowers or maybe your currency would be backed by aggregated um, test scores of uh, low you know children in low-income neighborhoods in san jose you know in data zone on these data dashboards like that could very well be the kind of currency we're talking about on blockchain um and so i talked about that a little bit and someone was like well maybe you shouldn't say that it will happen maybe you should say like it might happen or whatever which i'm kind of annoyed at because at the end essentially what i was talking about Cello keeps talking about Prosper, Prosper, Prosper. And I made this connection to Prospero, who in The Tempest was this artist magician who was sort of conjuring things and fooling people into certain understandings of the world that were not actually accurate. And then eventually sort of everybody like woke up and was able to grasp reality. And that's what I'm saying is that, yeah, all of this stuff, they're working in these sort of metaphysical realms of, um, but combined with military technology and behavioral psychology and things like, uh, you know, transmedia storytelling and intention setting. And so we, we have to like snap out of it and understand their tools and understand how we're being manipulated or at least be aware that that's a possibility, that they're manipulating reality and that they're going to tell us a story that we've solved the problem of the Ponzi scheme, crypto NFT crowd, where everyone's just being selfish and we're gonna instead put everybody on, um, tokenize everyone and tokenize their behavior and turn them into new alternative currency systems. Isn't that great? Won't that be fun and won't that be super democratic? Well, I'll just like be being democratic with our digital twins in our virtual agoras. And I think that that's definitely what's coming. So, um, so I was like, come on, like, I need a better comment. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, come on. I'm not saying this to scare people. I'm saying this to say, this is the mindset and we need to figure it out. And then we need to step out and, and set a new frame, set a new story. But in fact, here's a paper from January of 2022 that says tokenizing behavior change, a pathway for the sustainable development goals. And essentially it's all about blockchain based behavior change through internet of things and internet of things sensors and digital identity and crypto tokens in decentralized environments, which is web three. So honestly, you know, I don't really care about, I mean, I, I feel badly for people who were taken in by crypto Ponzi schemes. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that that was a good thing, but if we stop there, which seems to be where most of the resistance is stopping, and we don't talk about tokenized behavior in Web3 tied to alternative security issuances, because Stephen Deal and Darren Tseng, who were sort of the co-leaders of this uh, resistance event, um, both worked with Adjoint, uh, which is this sort of blockchain smart contract treasury settlement mechanism that is literally on the back bay of Boston in the John Hancock Tower. And they were working early on with Materium, which is Vinay Gupta, and he, he was um, involved, he, he presented remotely at the Mormon Transhumanist Conference, and he's in the um, humanitarian space, right? And, and, and Ian Grigg and Stephen Deal were being interviewed by this gentleman, Jason Love, L O. Uh, UV, which I hadn't heard of, but someone in the comments said, oh yeah, he writes occult books. Okay, so this materium seems maybe a bit Kabbalistic, um, matter, manipulating matter, manipulating intention and frequency, and then we're, we've got tokenized behaviors and alternative bond issuances, and nobody's really being like on the up and up and telling the whole story about what their background is and what their other like financial shenanigans are with new derivatives products in the resistance, right? Like they're keeping the conversation super duper narrow and that is being done on purpose. So um, yeah, so I've been like processing all of the, um, the flower tokens, the Mexican currency, the implications for both metamorphosis and using um, currency to reflect social values towards swarm intelligence and 
um, control society, control poor women and children, um, potentially link it to their genetic makeup because that's a part of this. And um, in this, you know, they have this Templeton article that's right in the middle. Um, and so I'm just going to say, because I'm going to read a couple of these, but before I get into the reading part, um, like I knew I wanted to come out. Um, you know, the Templeton Foundation, I, I realized it was here. I never bothered to actually look up the address. Um, there are quite a number of other uh, major uh, philanthropy offices just in this, not in the same building, but just within like five minute drive. So one of them is the Brooke Lenfest Foundation. Uh, Brooke Lenfest is the child of Jerry Lenfest, who was one of Philadelphia's most major uh, philanthropists. His fortune came in telecommunications and cable. It was a regional cable company, but he had super close ties to the Navy and ties to the Naval Reserve. Um, and he was actually... Um, wanted to restore the SS United States. So there's a lot about shipping and naval and like radar and frequency and telecom connected to the Lenfest. And there they were working in um, the education space, which at the time I thought about it as privatization of education. But really what they were doing was something called, um, they were supporting Mastery Charter School. And Mastery Charter School, and I think they were also supporting um, a Catholic school system that was separate from the parish-based churches. And it had a work-based learning component. So these um, uh, uh, parish churches and mastery charter was about mastery, competency-based education. So these are going to be the performative skill badges that you demonstrate either through work-based learning or for, through wearable technology. And that's going to be part of the, these human capital markets that are run through the telecom interests. And that relates to what I talked about last week at Bell Labs. So that's, that's the Lenfest Foundation. They also are one of the major funders of solutions journalism in Philadelphia. So they've taken over all of the nonprofit journalist programs. And I wrote a blog piece about that um, in coordination with the Annenberg School of Communication at Penn um, and also the, telecommu uh, the communications department at Temple University and uh, the communications department at Rutgers. So those are all involved in essentially setting up uh, all sorts of news, uh, print media, digital media, social media, uh, podcasting from everything from like the littlest Afrofuturist podcast to, you know, our paper of record, the Philadelphia Inquirer around poverty management for impact. And that's for these uh, markets that are coming online. So the other one is the W.W. Smith Foundation, which gives to another a number of social causes, but then also has this maritime component, which is again, unusual. Um, you know, right down the hill from me, we're on this sort of steep slope. Um, and I'll, I'll show you in a second, just the building. Um, but the Schuylkill, there's train tracks and then the Schuylkill River is just beyond. And the Schuylkill River is the, the hidden river in Dutch. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different philanthropies that I've always heard their names, but I didn't really know where they're located. So there's this sort of energetic synergy here in Conshohocken. Um, so yesterday afternoon, you know, I was trying to tear myself away from the computer and wanting to get out. And I've been feeling a little disconnected from people lately. And so I actually, I'd contacted a friend and we were gonna meet at, my, my, at Bartram's Garden um, and go for a walk in nature and then get some dinner, get an early dinner. And so I got there and I, as I was getting out of the car, I noticed that there was sort of a, a, a little sign in the parking circle, circuit uh, kind of like on, you know, one of those political signposts, you know, uh, you know, plastic pre-printed signs. Uh, and it was for something called Aqua Marooned. Um, and it had a QR code and you could scan it. And this Aqua Marooned was actually a, nat a nature game, a digital phone-based nature game that was looking at waterscapes. And this is something uh, that my friend Steffers has been looking at a lot. Um, in the discourse board is this idea of water, um, water on earth. I think they're talking primarily about watersheds, but also thinking about primary water. That's something that we're looking at and, and the natural seepages out of the ground that are not part of the um, uh, rain cycle, cycle of rain. And it's interesting because at Bartram's Garden, just below our little pond, there is a natural spring, a natural seep uh, that on which a cypress tree is planted, interestingly enough. So there is this natural seep and it has been there at least since the 18th century, this water. Um, it dries up some in the summer and then it comes back, but there's this natural seeping at, at the garden. Um, and so this aquascape thing, this aqua marooned, aqua marooned, it was unusual because it was by a company called Swim Pony and they were um, involved with this Drexel entrepreneurial gaming program. Now Drexel University is not far from the garden. Um, it's named after Anthony Drexel, Anthony 
Drexel was the mentor to JP Morgan. He and his family were involved in trading paper, like uh, uh, trading these uh, debt instruments paper. That's how they made their money. And actually Drexel uh, is now the home of the digital badge program that started under um, Michael Nutter's administration. So this sort of work-based learning that you would earn badges, uh, it was called digital on-ramps. And now the digital on-ramps uh, has moved into uh, Drexel and it's sort of hanging out there until everybody gets their digital identity. Um, but it's quite troubling to me to think about this idea of overlaying uh, performative behavior on nature through these online gaming systems. And, and it's very cartoonish, <coughs> which is not natural. Um, and it's actually framed, this, this game has, I don't know if it's an expansion pack, uh, for the Lenape. Uh, I think that the, the um, so it's an indigenous, they're adding like this indigenous layer, but it's cartoonish and it looks like sort of like alien creatures. And so one of the, the images on the sign said, oh, look, you can, um, the, the Lenape people would use shells and stones for ornaments. So why don't you go make an ornament or whatever? But the, the image that was used in, in, on the sign it was like a weird monster. It wasn't real. It wasn't actually nature. It wasn't actually indigenous. And, and that's also a bit of cultural appropriation, but like that you were making this connection and that it was off in so many ways. But it, it, to me, it reminded me of the conversation Leo and I had on the interspecies currency and this Oracle gaming program that you would go into nature and you would do these rituals. So, which is kind of weird because I'm sort of doing this, but I'm definitely not on an app. Like I'm definitely like not on an app at all. That there would be this um, QR coded version and that it would be connected to the water cycles um, and you know this was something I was really worried about like even when I worked there because I could see where everything was going and I kept saying you know it might not be a big deal it might not seem like a big deal at the time it might just be like hey would you like to participate in our initiative and here's a QR code and can we just stick it out on your grounds and would that be okay and it would be very hard to turn that away because, hey, it's supposed to be educational. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be innovative, right? And and so, yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> you know, I and you know, I, I left the garden in November um, over sort of the health policies. But now I'm realizing that, you know, I thought, like, I knew one day I was going to have to come if if the institution was not willing to sort of acknowledge what was happening and. You know, I, I, for me, I, I thought it would be health behaviors and I thought that they would be tracking like women on Medicaid with sort of smart shoes and things tied to diabetes and diabetes impact bonds. Um, but uh, water is, is a major green bond, stormwater runoff, different kinds of watershed initiatives. And so we've already seen, like now we're already seeing it. It's just a sign with a QR code, but to me, it's a signal that this new reality is coming, this new reality where data is turned into, nature is turned into data for a dashboard for these alternative currencies, you know? Um, it's, it's here, it's already here, and we haven't even started to have the conversation. We don't even have people who are educated enough to even start to have the conversation about it yet. Um, so anyway, it turned out that my friend couldn't make it, and I was kind of disappointed, but I've kind of come to the conclusion that when the world, like things happen the way they're supposed to happen. So I was like, don't worry about it. Like I've forgotten things, it's not a big deal. Like it's a beautiful afternoon and I've been meaning to get out anyway. So I, I brought my basket because I knew that I wanted to come here and I wanted to get some nice materials and I always like to go walk out on the mud banks of the Schuylkill and at the at Bartram's, it's one of the few places that's not bulkheaded that you can just white, walk right out onto the silt. Um, and so, yeah, so I gathered some things and I gathered, and, and the thing that was quite interesting to me that I've been walking those mud flats for at least 10 years. And on this particular occasion, there were all these little baby crabs. And it's, an est it's, a, it's a tidal river. There's a six foot tide. It goes down to the Delaware and the Delaware Bay. So there, it is tidal, but I had never seen crabs before. I mean, and they were little, like the, the I'll, I'll show you later. The, the biggest one was maybe this big, and then the rest were maybe the size of a quarter. But there, were, there was one big and three little crabs. And I thought, wow, like that, that says something, right? Um, and so I looked it up. And um, when I looked up sort of the crab, it's one, it's like, you're armored up, you know, but you can also be a little vulnerable, like when you're shedding your skin. It's sort of also resurrection and change. And because the crabs walk sideways, it's about like using new views on a problem. And 
skirting around uh, issues or confrontation or aggression, like finding alternate paths because they're wa walking sideways. It's like this non-traditional thing. And so I thought, wow, well, that's a good lesson, <laughs> right? When things are difficult, like look for an alternative path and like know that, you know, have the confidence to know that you have <clears throat> the protection to go up and like face hard things. So that, that felt pretty good. And um, so I, I, I went out and, you know, the thing about the tidal mud flats is there's trash and styrofoam and plastic, but then there's also natural stuff. And I got a new, a bit of wood. I don't know if you remember, but I left my all seeing eye up on the Alta ski resort in the snowstorm. And I've, I've been kind of sad about it, but I found another sort of knobby Rudy thing that had multiple eyes. They had like six eyes, which seems kind of appropriate to AI. I've seen some of these crazy fractal AI things. So, and it, it, it actually built around these little rocks. So it's this very craggy knobby, like multiple eyes. And given how fast things are going, like maybe I need something now that is one eye isn't enough. I need multiple eyes to keep keep track of all the all the developments. Um, and what else? Oh, I picked up some wonderful tobacco. And there was actually a small uh, section of corn, which I think is probably a little heirloom corn. They, they were selling seed of Navajo corn. And um, the corn wasn't in the best shape, like it had corn worms and smut and different things like that. But I, I did take one little ear because I do think, again, in Mexico, the conditional cash transfer, it was around um, the cosmology of corn and the Maya, the people of the corn and the corn tortilla subsidy and the food access for low income people and the dispossession off their lands and then the substitution with um, processed food and often genetically modified food of which corn is a huge part of that and both corn and it feels like tobacco are subject to these different kinds of um, biocomputational interventions that are coming. So it felt really good for me to be able to have um, some Nicotiana and some corn in there and and the crabs and some pokeweed because I still like magenta, even though I know it's an issue. I love pokeweed and the magenta and um, some little freshwater mussels, which were twinned again, sort of the twinned universe, the twin connections. Oh, and there was a big. So I found a piece of rope um, that I didn't take the whole rope, but it was fraying on the end in these three pieces. So we, they keep talking about the triple helix. So, so I cut some of the rope to make a spiral because I have a heart today and I have a spiral to sort of the energetic blowing out space. And there was this big pile of tangled fishing line on one of the um, bushes. So I cut off the fishing twine and I laid on it um, a lovely heart. So when I got back from the Bell Labs um, week before last, um, there was a package uh, from a friend of a friend who was making hand-sewn hearts. Um, so it was perfect. So I picked this green heart um, and this person had a connection to, to an institution I've been researching, which was, makes it even more significant. And so I brought the heart. So I have a laid out um, uh, like uh, the heart and the corn with a, a love and a puff and the Nicotiana and a lot of walnuts. Well, Bartram's has this wonderful walnut tree and a crystal, uh, crystalline quartz, and then a piece of pottery, a piece of broken 19th century pottery. And um, yeah, so, so, oh, and um, Osage orange, which I love because they're like brains. They're like nature's brains. And the, oh, you'll, I might pause for a second. There's a train going by. Seems like it's kind of a long train. All right, so the, the train is finally gone. Um, yeah, we still have a lot of freight trains through here. The main line, right? The main line. Um, so I do want to make a correction that uh, that interactive game, it had a QR code, but I guess it's an interactive card game. So there are cards that I guess you get, um, like packs of cards, but um, and you're supposed to take them out into nature, but they, they frame it as like an intergalactic project, but it's, it's the Delaware watershed. So I'm not sure what has the space element and the, the unnatural has to do with any of it, but they, it's sort of programmed about laughing and playing. And, and so it's very prescriptive. Like you're not just allowed to go. I mean, 
it's guided. I guess it's a guided experience. Not that you can't go out into nature, but that, that they want to sort of condition people that you need a pack of cards to tell you what to do. And that's not unlike these smart playgrounds where they're, you know, you go with your phone and you do interactive storytelling on the playground in, in you know, connected to some literacy social impact bond program. Um, so anyway, so so there was a lot of stuff. I got a root up with a bunch of clunky eyes and rocks in it. So I'm going to carry that around for a while and, until something moves me in and then I get, I get a replacement. Um, and let's see, what else did I have? I got a passion fruit flower, which always to me does look like outer space, um, but it, it kind of shrunk up overnight. So it's just a bit of a, a, a niggly bit. And in a linden, I got a, a bit of a linden because remember Linden Labs and Philip Rosedale. I was looking at some stuff with Pavel Luxia and uh, Rus Nano and neural nets and new forms of education. And um, this was way back in 2014, some work that I was looking at. And Philip Rosedale and, and Second Life was in on it, um, been in on it for a while. Um, Oh, and I'm jumping around a bit, but again, that game, the card game, it was backed by the Knight Foundation. And the Knight Foundation is really central to uh, transmedia storytelling and community level gaming and um, working with Niantic on augmented cities. So even though it's a card game now, I, I, I suspect at some point in the future with Web3, it's not gonna be a card game anymore. It's gonna be some sort of other alternative LARPy wearable technology. Um, all right, so I think, so I wanna say before, before I get started with the reading, um, my friend Deep Dee, we're, we're less in touch now that we're off of social media, but right before, and she didn't know I was coming out today, um, I left, she, t she texted me this image, and she's in Goa, India, so she's, she, we're sort of the east-west um, balancing act, and so she sent me this intention, and I just wanna read it because I think it's perfect. Um, may, uh, it says, uh, Loka Samasta, Sukino Bavantu. Loka Samasta suki, Sukino Bavantu. May all beings everywhere be happy and free, and may the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. It's not perfect. That is just like the universe showing up for you, right? I'm like, I gotta get out there. I gotta hurry up and get put my shoes on and go. And then this comes, which is perfect. Um, so there's that. And um, and then the other thing that I have that, I've left copies of that here. And the other thing that I'm gonna leave here, just to sort of set the tone, since these are both religious groups, and I forgot to mention, in addition to the John Templeton Foundation, which is um, central to, again, the religion, the theoretical physics, the genius, uh, the free markets, uh, they work very closely with the Fetzer Institute. And someone in a video, um, uh, within the past couple of weeks, they commented about John Fetzer, and I didn't know who John Fetzer was. And I really appreciate them bringing up his name because he is important. And so John Fetzer was a um, an entrepreneur. He grew up Seventh-day Adventist. So that's the Kellogg Foundation. That's the Kellogg family, which is, um, you know, alternative health practices, uh, vegetarianism, uh, different sort of holistic health things. And then the Kellogg brothers were, were central to that. And now the Kellogg Foundation is very involved in UBI. And also I think Mayan language translation, which is interesting when I think about all of the things that are going on with the Mexican money and the corn and everything. So I don't know how that that's all working with the cosmology, but um, uh, he was seven. So the, going back to John Fetzer, he was Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist raised. He went to a college that was affiliated with the church. Uh, he was recruited there to build the first radio station in Michigan, and he set it up. He loved radios and frequencies and electronic communications. And this is early on in like the 19 teens or 20s. He rose up through the ranks. He eventually sort of built a small, um, you know, uh, well, a growing presence in radio in Michigan around Kalamazoo. And eventually he, he did very well for himself and he uh, was involved with uh, censorship monitoring during World War II, I think it was, with the FCC. And uh, eventually made a lot of money and I think it was the owner of the Detroit Tigers for many years and was very, very well known in that regard. Um, he was a high level Mason and throughout his life he, I think, I'm trying to remember he did join a regular mainstream church like maybe presbyterian or something um but 
he explored all sorts of different um, spiritualist and alternative religious practices. So he's very involved in spiritualism and going to this, um, oh, it's escaping me now. Chester, the Chesterfield, Chesterfield, like a gathering in Indiana where the spiritualists would all go and like commune with the other side. Um, eventually Rosicrucianism, theosophy, uh, all sorts of different sort of transcendental parapsychology, spiritualist angles. And he, he was very interested in frequency and energy because of his business in radio. And um, also how that resulted in manifesting wealth. And he felt like because he was wealthy that he was sort of helping these ascended masters uh, develop their plan on earth where we would all have this higher level of Christ consciousness. And so much of the money he actually left after his death was to create this Fetzer Institute, which is again, sort of interfaith, alternative things. And the Fetzer Institute works very closely with the John Templeton Foundation. So I feel like once you understand this, this is moving into this Aquarian age or this Ascension thing or the no sphere, whether that's you're into like Teilhard de Jardin or Vernadsky or Aquarian or Theosophy or Baha'i, you know, all of this collective swarm intelligence, this feels like where they want to take it, only they want to take it by financing and tokenizing behavior, sustainable behavior on the blockchain. And when I think back about, um, again, this Orson Scott card book, Xenocide, and the drones, and the, the, the hive queen talking about the drones saying they're happy. They don't really want much. I mean, they're taken care of. They don't have independent agency, but they're not unhappy. They just are, they just are. And so I feel like increasingly with all of these situations is that with frequency and telemedicine, energetic, bio, op, you know, opto electronics and these things like, is the goal that we all just become drones, that we all just become homogenous, we all have this sort of low level, interfaith, religious, energetic, worker mentality of being good behaviors or something, like for our good behavior currency, which is all the stuff that's coming with social emotional learning and PBIS and token economies in the classroom. Do, are we all like, you know, that's, I keep joking that the KIPP, the Knowledge is Power Charter School, they just want to KIPP the world. They just want to give everybody a UBI at this sort of baseline level and we all just become drones. And to me, that's the antithesis of actually being human and being creative and being individual and having this amazing ability to process and think and create and build and conceive of new ideas, which is something that I've been trying to do lately. And it's really tiring. <laughs> And it's hard for me to know if it's working or not. And um, even yesterday when I was out on the, the, the silt mud flats and going through the trash and trying to find the things I wanted to find. And afterwards, there's this promontory rock that's out on the Schuylkill. And I was, I was sitting up there. You can look over the water. And, and it, because it's tidal, you can see the, the waves, the frequency waves on the water. And, and so I was just sort of sitting there zoning out, just kind of being connected to the universe. And within like two minutes of me sitting there, a bald eagle showed up and it was pretty amazing. And it flew in, it just, it flew in and it, and it didn't fly by. It literally circled the river right in front of my field of vision for like five minutes, which is a long time for an eagle. Like it didn't alight on a branch. It, I didn't see it dive. I saw some fish down there. I thought maybe it would, would take a shot at what some of the fish, but it just, it circled just so I could definitely see that it wasn't a gull, you know, it was not a seagull, not that there's anything wrong with seagulls, but it was definitely a bald eagle, which we have them on the Delaware, I mean, on the, in the Delaware Bay and the Delaware watershed and the Schuylkill, but um, it was a treat. I don't think I've ever seen a bald eagle for that long, except for that one time in South Dakota, also on the water. So it felt like that was the, the universe, God, whatever, giving me a sign, like you're doing, you're on the right track. Um, so yes, so I'm trying to contribute to the happiness and freedom for all so that we all don't become drones in the collective consciousness imagined by some um, free Masonic ascended masters <laughs> working with the ascended masters um, to push us all into the collective hive mind. Um, so before I read the, um, the, the Templeton article, and I, I'm gonna read this whole thing just so you, I have it on record. Um, I'm gonna read Psalm 33, which I know is an unusual number, but when I went to Shrine Mont, um, 
when I went to Shrine Mont, that there was this, this book of common prayer and the ribbon bookmark was to Psalm 33. And it starts with uh, frequency and music. So I think that feels important. So I'm just gonna set the tone here because I think the general intent is that God is like above all, above man's intentions. So as much as they may I have this idea that they're gonna tokenize us and put us on nano sensors, I, I don't think that the, the creative force of the universe is gonna let that stand. So Psalm 33 says, um, uh, re rejoice. Okay, well, I just realized that I had unplugged the microphone, so I had to stop for a second. Okay, so I'm gonna read Psalm 33. Uh, praise of the Lord's power and providence. Oh, and you know what? First, I think I'm going to start with the beauty bowl. I've got my sweet grass here. Okay, Psalm 33. Praise of the Lord's power and providence. Rejoice, you just in the Lord. Praise from the upright is fitting. Give thanks to the Lord on the harp, on the ten-string lyre. Offer praise. Sing to God a new song. Skillfully play with joyful chant. For the Lord's word is true and all his works are trustworthy. The Lord loves justice and right and fills the earth with goodness. By the Lord's word, the heavens were made by the breath of his mouth, all their host. The waters of the sea were gathered as in a bowl, in cellars the deep was confined. Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all who dwell in the world show reverence. For he spoke and it came to be, uh, commanded and it stood in place. The Lord foils the plans of nations, frustrates the designs of peoples, but the plan of the Lord stands forever. Wise designs through all the generations, Happy the nation whose God is the Lord, the people chosen as his very own. From heaven the Lord looks down and observes the whole human race, surveying from the royal throne all who dwell on earth. The one who fashioned the hearts of them all knows all of their work. And I think the heart is really important there. The Taurus. A king is not saved by a mighty army, nor a warrior delivered by great strength. Useless is the horse for safety. It is it, its great strength, no sure escape. But the Lord's eyes are upon the reverent, upon those who hope for his gracious help, delivering them from death, keeping them alive in times of famine. Our soul waits for the Lord, who is our help and shield. For in God our hearts rejoice, in your holy name we trust. May your kindness, Lord, be upon us. We have put our hope in you. And so I think that that's what we hold on to when we're dealing with all of this nano nonsense, is that there's more out there than what the human mind can conjure. We're pretty creative, but we're also very fallible. Okay, so this is from Deedsight. Uh, this was May 4th, 2006. Money teaches prayer. This is the English translation. Originally, it was in German. How the American Templeton Foundation is using its wealth to bring science to the path of faith by Christian Schuller. Now they have reached Europe. The late modern knights of the religious guys continue their struggle for the spiritual optimization, spiritual optimization of the species on the continent. The John Templeton Foundation from Philadelphia has embarked on a campaign to retouch the Western worldview of enlightened rationalism. Their goal is a movement against the secular world. Their methods are agenda setting and mass sponsorship. The eye of God above the pyramid of knowledge. And that's what they had on the, the image in the video was the, the eye, the all-seeing eye. A motif from the build dollar bill. The foundation has at least $800 million at its disposal, of which it invests $40 million annually in scientific projects to explore and discover the power and potential of the human mind. It cannot be called Christian in the fundamentalist sense since it represents a non-denominational concept of the spirituality in God. Even atheists are encouraged and no one has to make a declaration of faith. Nor can the foundation be accused of targeted subversion. Its fields of action are as ideologically unsuspicious as scientific conferences, conventions, study programs, and school courses. 
In Templeton, American pragmatism and spiritual piety merge into a metaphysical alloy that is not only intended to counteract the supposed dissolution of values, it aims extremely cleverly at diffusion of the disciplines, at least as the permeability of hardcore natural sciences for spiritual religious concerns. Templeton wants the dialogue between natural sciences, theology, and religiosity. The foundation does not support two-dimensional research, flat science. Those who apply for money commit themselves to a certain extent to go into the third, the spiritual dimension. The foundation systematically sponsors research dedicated to spiritual progress with the clear goal of scientific proof of the transcendence and God. If Templeton has his way, there should be a humble worldwide effort to empirically prove the healing power of faith and to objectively anchor the importance of religion in the world. The foundation considers rationalistic demarcations between knowledge and belief to be outdated. The campaign of philanthropy began in the United States in the late 1980s. Since then, the name Templeton has appeared more and more often, hidden or openly, on the academic agenda of Germany as well. In 2005, for example, the Evangelical Academy in the Rhineland in Bonn organized a cooperation conference entitled Theology and the Natural Sciences, New Approaches to Research and Dialogue. The conference was funded with funds from the John Templeton Foundation. Last September, the freelance journalist Thomas Gertner from Dresden was awarded the John Templeton Prize, European Religious Writer of the Year, awarded by the Conference of European Churches. Uh, the Research Center for International and Interdisciplinary Theology at the University of Heidelberg recently asked for applications for its John Templeton Award for Theological Promise. Postdocs from all over the world can feel addressed 12 of whom will each receive $10,000 for the best dissertation or the first postdoc opus dedicated to the topic God and Spirituality. In mid-December 2005, the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt on Main hosted the international symposium, I think, therefore I am me, question mark, the self between neurobiology, philosophy, and religion. Researchers of the highest reputation were invited, including Hans Gerler, Jürgen Habermas, Hans-Dieter Muxler, uh, Michael Powen, and Wolf Singer. The conference was open, the opening event of the Templeton Lectures, endowed with $500,000, which the Institute for Research on Philosophy of Religion at Frankfurt University has raised. The theology of humility is closely related to the person of the Presbyterian Christian Sir John Marx Templeton. Born in 1912 in Winchester, rural Tennessee, he wanted to be a missionary and after studying at Yale and Oxford began a fascinating career on Wall Street in 1931. In 1954, he founded the Templeton Growth Fund, one of the most successful mutual funds in the world, and quadrupled his wealth in a short period of time. Giving up his American passport in the 1960s, he became a British citizen and was knighted by the Queen in 1987 for his philanthropic services. At $1.3 million, the prize is the highest in the world for one person and will be presented at Buckingham Palace in London. The winners included Mother Teresa, 1973, Billy Graham, 1982, Carl Friedrich von Weisacker, 1989, Paul Davies, 1995, Holmes Rolston III, 2003, and John D. Barrow in 2006. Finally, in 1987, the billionaire founded the John Templeton Foundation donating large parts of his fortune and establishing research centers, chairs, and publications around the world. He wrote books about the 200 worldwide spiritual principles, agape, love, and he formulated the so-called Templeton Plan, 21 Steps to Personal Success and True Happiness. Um, Sir John's core belief alongside the healing power of unconditional love is the hope that spirituality, theology, and religion will have the same careers that medicine, science, and cosmology have for the last 300 years. In 1992, he sold his fund to the Franklin Group for $440 million and became a full-time philanthropist. He lives in Nassau in the Bahamas. The foundation is managed today by his son, John M. He's since passed, um, the, 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 Mr. Temp the first Mr. Templeton. From the very beginning, the foundation has sought to get closer to its goal of scientific universal spirituality through declared research priorities unlimited love, spirituality and health, character development, the power of purpose, free enterprise, and forgiveness. One of Templeton's major programs was the project begun in 1997 on the psychology of forgiveness and its putative effect on individual health. 
In five years of work, Templeton not only wants to have scientifically verified the psychological effectiveness of a theological construct, there is no doubt that forgiveness research has triggered a wave of publications and studies planting idealistic seeds that are gradually being reaped. Checking the American Psychological Association Psych Info Index database of the number of times the word forgiveness or forgive appears in the title of psychological periodicals reveals a startling increase in 1984. Forgiveness or forgive appeared in eight titles, in 1994, in 14, in 2004, 66. The term spiritual or spirituality achieved a similar result. In 1984, 25 articles had it in the title. In 1994, there were 92, and in 2004, 322, a 13-fold increase. The root word religio appeared in 126 titles in 94, 195, uh, sorry, in 84, 195 in 1994, and 468 in 2004, nearly quadrupling. The potentiation suggests that psychologists, religious scholars, and sociologists um, can scientifically measure forgiveness and have thus objectified its effect. In a Gallup poll, more than 80% of Americans said they needed God's help to be merciful. The healing power of prayer to be scientifically proven. To date, there has been an avalanche of around 1,200 studies in the USA that pursue the thesis that belief in God and spirituality are health promoting. Um, intercessory prayers from afar have healing effects. The power of prayer reduces heart attacks and strokes. The spiritual rector of this religious medicine is the frequent publicist Harold G. Koenig, director of the Center for the Study of Religion and Spirituality and Health at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He has written 18 books and 160 scientific articles on the supposed connection between health and religion. In his book, The Healing Power of Faith, dedicated to Sir John Templeton, Koenig claims to have proved that religious belief protects against depression and that the main causes of human death can be combated through the healing power of belief. The empirical evidence is sparse and the American Heart Journal has just published results of a large long-term study by Harvard Medical School that clearly refutes the notion that intercessory prayer is beneficial to health. When Templeton is not a direct sponsor and client, funds are distributed by organizations such as the Fetzer Institute, the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love, the Office of Prayer Research, and the National Institute of Healthcare Research, and the Meta Nexus Institute on Religion and Science, which, if they cannot even be described as subsidiary organizations, are at the very least very close to the foundation in terms of ideology and personnel. MetaNexus has been around since 1998. Until 2002, the organization was called the Philadelphia Center for Religion and Science. One of their mottos is, God is in the details. Among other things, MetaNexus operates an international online forum with users in 57 countries and strives for worldwide networking of groups and researchers and their access to, meta, uh, to a meta library. The scientifically highly dubious neurotheology has meanwhile set a precedent. In The Spiral, in the March 2004 MetaNexus newsletter, Mario Beauregard, associate professor in the Department of Radiology and Psychology at the University of Montreal in Canada, then provides information about his participation in MetaNexus Spiritual Transformation Research Project. Beauregard's project is entitled Neurobiology of the Mystical Experience. While examining Carmelite nuns in a convent in Montreal, he claims to have found neurochemical correlates for the mystical union with God. Beauregard meets with Newberg and the pugnacious geneticist Dean Hammer in the naturalistic intention of teaching neurobiological evidence of human spirituality. These neurotheologians are convinced that there is a common biological origin of all spiritual desires, meaning that spirituality, at least in part, is inheritable. Hammer even claimed last year to have located a god gene. Four years ago, the MetaNexus set out an extremely seductive bait to promote their cause, the so-called Local Societies Initiative. The idea behind this is a global network of like-minded researchers. Technical progress should be reflected culturally, that is, always spiritually through the discursive interweaving of science and religion. MetaNexus recruits as many institutes or teams as possible via brochures, email circulars, newsletters, and information from professional associations. After an acceptable letter of intent, they will receive $5,000 per year and commit to contributing an additional $5,000 from other sources, totaling $30,000 per project over three years. Uh, through, uh, through the modality and methodology of its calls for proposals, the Foundation receives a welcome overview of thematic interests and project ideas from faculties around the world, as well as access data for those researchers who could be of such interest to the network. 
Any researcher can apply for individual funding, such as the Spiritual Capital Program, with a letter of intent. Spiritual Capital, can ma imagine that with impact finance. Um, the top 40 made it to the final selection and were allowed to submit a proposal. In the end, 10 were awarded a contract for a total of $150,000, which is unusual for the scientific community. The foundation is tightly organized and interested in efficiency. Every dollar should pay off in spiritual, uh, spiritually. Anyone who, like the Knights of Templeton, wants to work on the scientific proof of transcendence leverages the third-party funding dictate of the universities and elegantly smuggles their Trojan horses into university faculties, which are forced to collect project-related research funds from non-university institutions or organizations. Since 1998 at the University of California, Berkeley, a conference sponsored by the Templeton Foundation on Science and the Spiritual Quest took place. American colleges offer hundreds of seminars on science and religion. Since then, more and more physicists, chemists, chemists um, and biologists have publicly acknowledged the limits of their knowledge. Since then, financially drained academies, including Europe, have been surviving with Templeton money. So far, the humanity, humanities faculties of European universities have been uh, the last reserves of a largely uninterested, that is to say, open-ended research with the scientific independence seems to be gradually compromised. The gradual expulsion of the spirit from the humanities has received greater legitimacy in the third dimension. Even if at first glance all of this seems unreserved, transparent, and legitimate, the dangers of Templetonization lie in the subcutaneous. First, it can be argued that targeted funding distorts and influences the curriculum and research plan because it needs the financial support. A faculty will readily add a Templeton-style seminar lect or lecture to the curriculum. Who at his university, a course, who at his university, a course on science and religion, has received ten thousand dollars in the past from the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences at Berkeley, a subgroup of Templeton? The more institutes and group, groups offer such courses, the stronger the impression of large-scale significant research on a paradigm shift grows. Even if only a few valid bits of knowledge jump out here or there with respect to the goal of academizing the spiritual dimension, they are always usable. They are always usable, especially since Templeton has its own journalistic troops and a very contemporary marketing concept. The earmarking of research jeopardizes its independence. Second, Templeton requires that a specific canon of reading be covered, which the foundation is happy to specify. The Books of Distinction program lists 39 recommendations from the Templeton Foundation Press, intended to raise awareness of spirituality from John Barrow to Paul Davies and John Polkingshorn to V.S. Uh, uh, Ramachandran. Although most scientists identify themselves as atheists, Templeton lists, uh, the Templeton's list suggests that science and religion are in perfect harmony. Sorry, I need to, my foot is falling asleep. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Third, metaphysically motivated research opens a door that is difficult to close. If a private foundation like Templeton can influence the scientific curriculum in such a way, uh, when will racist foundations succeed in promoting IQ projects and proving supremacy of the white race? By subsidizing studies, symposium, and conferences, which are in principle laudable, by advertising various prizes and sponsoring research committees, Templeton gradually brought a spiritual worldview that eventually seeped into society via the intellectual and cultural elite, via universities and the media. It doesn't have to be based on propaganda or messianic zeal. The consequence lies in the insidious theologizing of science and the sellout of research that is critical of religion or of God through Christian patronage. Conversely, this means that critical research on the negative influence of religion on life is made almost impossible. The Templeton activities are particularly explosive in view of the ongoing ideological controversy between creationists and evolutionists in the USA. Creationists are um, conservative apologists of Christian doctrine of creation who campaign against the Darwinian origin of species, and instead of arguing with genealogies, points to miracles. Support for the existence of a creator God has increased in recent years in new creationism, received a new quality insofar as the natural scientists are made um, theistic, premises that this, uh, theistic premises the starting point of their work. Keywords are irreducible complexity and especially intelligent design. The latter is scientifically legitimized creationism and aims at the conviction that an intelligent designer created life according to his blueprint, which according to the state of things can only be a God. ID cannot be tested, verified, or disproved, but the ID movement is 
well-funded and heavily supported by Templeton. The foundation has recognized and impressively captured the contemporary longing for spiritual growth, spiritual devotion, and mystical identity. In the fight against the secular world, she is the best in the best company, the um, Manichaean thought structure of the um, current American government. Kingdom of light versus kingdom of darkness, axis of good versus axis of evil, has already permanently changed the order of the outer world. Templeton changed the axis coordinates to the inner one. It is the anti-enlightenment attempt to de-differentiate out differentiated sorry it is the anti-enlightenment attempt to de-differentiate out differentiated systems to metaphysically appropriate the scientific establishment and to reduce formal evidence of verifiable results to the substantial evidence of verifiable transcendence right now when religious fundamentalism is spreading and has to be observed scientifically and independently the paradigm of faith research is emerging that relies on positive psychology instead of critical reflection but Templeton organizes research not for the sake of research, for the, but for the safe, sake of effectiveness. The foundation has staying power. She won't run out of money. So that's kind of an interesting article. Actually, I hadn't read the whole thing previously. And um, it's an interesting angle because one of the things I've been talking about um, is like I think that there is an intention to delegitimize faith practices and make spiritual people scary um and i i would say i have concerns about melding religion into science for the opposite reason is that like i think faith should stand aside from science and this idea that you have to scientifically prove faith is disadvantageous to faith in and of itself to, to make it fit within the constraints of science and i think that that is being done because there is an intention to make it measurable and commodifiable to optimize people through some sort of biocomputational evidence-based programming, um, you know, the Namsheb of Inki into some sort of Aquarian age, right? This ascension, which to me doesn't feel natural, um, especially if it's not running through some sort of blockchain neuro economy or neuro theological economy. Um, and I feel like that's their goal. Templeton's goal isn't it's not, I don't think it's what they said here, that they, I, I think that the narrative around faith practices, not that there's nothing to it, but I think that they actually want to bring the science in because they want to make it a science. They want to reduce religion to a science so that they can measure it and that they could start doing the engineering. Um, and I think that this idea of alternative currencies that I mentioned at the beginning, the flower currencies, um, they want us to model our social values. They want to tokenize this as um, a social movement, as a religious movement, as a value-based movement, as a character-based movement, so that they can feed it to their robots and their machines under the pretense that they're optimizing us for some bigger future of being drones. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm getting a little tired, so I'm not gonna read this whole paper, but I am gonna read the beginning just so people can see that this is really happening. I'm not making this up, I'm not speculating. We need to be looking at Ian Grigg and Materium and Stephen Deal and Darren Sang and a joint and their new think tank on emerging technology and how it fits into socially progressive um, blockchain web three tokenized behaviorism uh, that's gonna, I think, masquerade as something that's benevolent when it's really exactly the opposite. And we need to realize that this thing is rushing ahead um, one of the, there are um, four authors of this paper. The paper is called Tokenizing Behavior Change, A Pathway for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it's in um, Frontiers in Blockchain Perspective, published on January 24th, 2022. Um, it's Ian Barkley. Barkley is interesting because that's the, the Quaker Barkley, the banking family. Um, I don't know that he's related, but the Barclays were this quake, important, significant Quaker banking family. And I've talked about the, the Barclays and hypothecation and trading paper, which goes back to what the Drexels were doing. Oh, and I will say too, this building, this office building here, um, when I pulled in, there was a special parking space for um, Mr. McGuire. And I'm trying to think, I think it's James McGuire. And um, there was a statue up front with this runner. And, and there was a quote underneath about the race not belonging to the swiftest, but for the person who keeps going. And that, that was noted as Mr. McGuire's quote. And Mr. McGuire is um, 
the head of Philadelphia Insurance. So we've talked about this before, the role of the insurance companies in this and using the premiums to seed these tokenized behavior markets and to keep everyone running the race. And the race is the cybernetic game uh, towards who knows what end, but we're, they wanna keep us in their maze. They wanna keep us in their maze and we need to wake up to the, the Prospero's um, magic, you know, fake magic and, and their, their contrived tempest in a teapot, right? The, the, the Utah teapot, the tempest in the teapot. Um, and get out of the teapot, get out of the tempest and like get our own bearings in our own um, understanding of creation and faith and groundedness in the natural world. So, so there's a Barclay, there's also a Jacob Hackle. And I know Hackle is um, one of these early um, sort of eugenicist, uh, like embryologists, uh, back into the 19th century, sort of this early looking at like more the creationism, the organismic aspect. And I think, you know, the whole Darwinian evolution is go, sort of going out the, you know, it's more complicated. We, we need to talk about saltational evolution. We need to talk about epigenetics. We need to talk about, um, you know, Jen Lake has been talking about sort of uh, like the proteins and gene expression and how all of this works together. Like the old hat version of how we wanted to talk about DNA and ge genetic modification, um, it's getting a lot more complex and sophisticated. And I, th I think the scientists, like the Jason scientists would have known that for a long time, but now it's, it's leaking out into the public sphere. So this idea of um, Lamarck, organismic, uh, changing gene structure in, a way, in ways that are heritable, this is all stuff that's gonna become like just common everyday stuff that we're talking about. So the way that that article at the design ended about we need to uphold Dar Darwin and not think about this creationism, like the horse is out of the barn on that with the synthetic biology folks. Like th there's a lot more going on than this really dumbed down conversation that they were trying to have in that article. It's a lot more sophisticated. We need to step up, <laughs> raise the bar. We need to step up and raise the bar and have a more nuanced conversation about what's actually going on. And in the space, I will say, um, from through Leo's research, I found out about the Oneothera lamarckiana, which is an evening primrose uh, that I think it was de Broglie was looking at it, um, it jumping through doing the saltational evolution, like major changes. It's a, a, a yellow flowered plant. And actually it was a plant that was discovered in in North America by the Bartrams and sent over there. So, and we have a small patch of Oneothera uh, lamarckiana um, it's by this little pond, which at the base of this pond is the spring, which who knows if it possibly is primary water um, that's flowing through the cypress tree at the bottom of Bartram's garden. So I think that's really interesting. And so I clipped a bit of the Oneothera Lamarckiana, which is relevant to the whole Darwinian discussion. So I'm just gonna read the, the abstract to this. So you know that these abstract financial products are coming and we need to be ready. And we need, I need more people helping me research this stuff. Seriously, I, we need a lot more people besides, you know, Leo doing some work, um, Steffer's doing some work, I think Seb's is doing some work and us on the discourse boards, but unpacking the impact finance piece. Um, to be successful and sustainable, social impact programs require individuals and groups to change aspects of their behavior. As blockchain-based tokens are increasingly adopted to target social outcomes, it is important to properly define these activities as behavior change interventions. And they call these BCI, which is interesting because BCI is also brain-computer interface. Behavior change interventions are brain-computer interface, or maybe your brain-computer interface will help you with your behavior change interventions. Um, and assess their design and management as such, otherwise there is significant risk of possible unintended consequences. Oh, you think so, right? Designing tokens as behavior change interventions requires new constructs beyond those currently in use to model interdependence of digital social ecosystems and integration of token engineering, crypto economics, and behavioral skill sets to test token designs within various ecosystems. New token design and testing protocols that integrate behavior measures around the targeted social outcomes are needed to fill a critical gap in current practice. Hence, new standards, operational frameworks, and ethics, yeah, who's talking about the ethics, are needed to guide the use of tokens at scale as tools to achieve social impacts, such as attaining the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Meeting these needs requires a collaborative approach between token design actors, 
computer scientists, crypto economists, token engineers, and social impact practitioners who will be increasingly called upon to use tokens as behavior change tools. Th this paper begins to identify common ground in areas um, and address areas to further develop research and practice of tokens being used for social impact. Now, um, the individuals who wrote this paper are connected to um, the, the School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University in Cardiff, UK. Uh, Pangora Group, which is described as being in Denver, Colorado, and that's, Jason, pay attention to that. And that's also Learning Economy has its core uh, pilot for digital identity and learning badges and learning tokens. And they have this new Learn Card where they're melding work-based learning and badges and currency and digital wallets. And they were just at the United Nations um, conference doing a whole program around finance of the future of education and the future of work, which is important because some of this future of work is going to be gamified puzzle solving for biotech and synthetic biology. So it's just cycling this awful, like optimized cybernetic bio nano ascendant thing. And then they're, they're paying us in tokens to play games and do puzzles to help turn us into something that is non-human. Uh, the Research Institute for Crypto Economics um, at Vienna University of Economics and uh, the Polta Institute at the University of Notre Dame. So Notre Dame's business school has been central in the Vatican impact finance space. So that's really important that it's Notre Dame and the fact that it's the Vienna um, University Institute for Crypto Economics. So today, and I'm going to put a link to this because I, I need people to think it out. I'm not saying it's a good infographic, but it's sort of my note taking about this. I'm starting from like the flower um, digital money instrumentation. I'm thinking this is all centered on Vienna looking at Ludwig uh, von Bertenlaffy, who was the early uh, developer. He was a biologist of systems engineering. And he was a Nazi, <laughs> essentially, he was a Nazi. He was like early systems biology, and he eventually came to the US. And I think he, he ended his career in Buffalo. Um, and he was uplifted by many of the, he was like the father of systems engineering, really central, like Laszlo looked to Burton Laffey. Mix that systems engineering with Austrian School of Economics, which is sort of um, economic independent agency, right? So you've got that. Mix that with the Vienna School of Psychoanalysis, which is Freud, which is Jung, which is Adler. So you've got sort of frequency alternative field energy, which is what Fetzer was after. You've got um, systems engineering. You have modeled economic constructs um, with the, the sense that you're free, that you have free agency, but you don't really have free agency. Like from within that, there's something called the Austria Technical corporation um, and there's an article Raul has in Silicon Icarus that talks about their role in smart city development. Um, then you've got uh, Kino. So Bill Sarubi is with the Foundation for um, Cycles, the found Foundation for the Study of Cycles, which is again the frequency waves and market forecasting and, and futures predicting and alternative futures. They have something called the Kinos Institute uh, that's based in Vienna that's this futurist group in market forecast. So that kind of connects with the, the Mises Austrian economics. Um, and then you've got, you know, you've got the flower currency, you have this esoterica, right? You've got um, occulted things. Um, Vienna, uh, Austria, really a big center for Freemasonry and Roll's membership series goes into some of that with Steiner and free, early Freemasonry and Austria and Hungary and how that interfaces. But you've got like the Jewish community of Vienna and the Kabbalistic outlook, but then Austria is very, very Catholic. So you have the Catholic mysticism. So you've got all of that put together. And then you have this other thing called the Vienna School, which I had not heard of before. But it was an early 20th century philosophy group that was anti-metaphysics, anti-spiritual, and only involved in logic, only that which could be proven, which is very much linked to this deontic logic of smart contracts, which again loops back to Grigg and these Ricardian contracts that are going to be smart contracts of logic under law. And so it's this strange, to me it feels like there are these two things going on, is that the people who know the game, like the Fetzers and the Templetons, um, understand that it's, it's, it's an open-ended universe, a holographic universe of waveforms that are synchronized and modulated and 
this dance of the spheres and the energy and wave and matters and standing waves and matter and that we are energy and the sun and and then but they want to keep us in their cybernetic circuits um they want to keep us in the circuit and so that we don't know our way out and they will be weirdest thing just happened so when i was talking about the circuits they want to keep us in the circuits and um so and then the battery the memory filled up so i had to stop and and as I was trying to clear out, like empty off some videos in the space on the phone, like a hundred motorcycles went by. <laughs> and I, literally like I'm off the highway, but I'm on this little access road that nobody goes on. I mean, it's like this back, it doesn't go anywhere to like a dead end up there. So I have no idea where these hundred motorcycles came from, but who knows what the universe has planned. There's always some surprises. So yeah, so they wanna keep us in some kind of cybernetic circuit and not having access to the amazing potential of the natural world. And so I'm just gonna like go back to this token paper. I, you know, it, it talks about ecosystems of interest. So they don't want us to be in the natural ecosystem. They want us to be in their system. And it says here, emerging research um, and practice places emphasis on ledger design, maintaining transparency, security, and immutability. Now more is needed to link this layer with the behavioral relationships they seek to modify, spanning real world contexts in the ecosystems they are embedded in, namely uh, digital ecosystems comprised of one, a digital society, two, rights and governance, um, oh, digital society rights and governance is one, digital economy and digital infrastructure. And then there's a tokenized ecosystem those actors who influence the desired social outcome and are in turn influenced by the design of the token to achieve the desired behavior. And then the ledger ecosystem. The blockchain ledger is a substrate for the token and it provides the immutable, transparent and secure accounting, right? And so this is, I mean, they've got this planned out guys and the churches are gonna play a major role in this. I'm telling you, the churches are gonna play a major role because they're gonna be the social welfare providers and they're, they're gonna just roll over and they're gonna let people have their data collected and they'll tell you it's private and secure and it shows us how um, it lets us live our values and demonstrate our values in tangible ways and, and it creates beautiful money by investing in good things, which are the sustainable development goals, which might involve having a giraffe wear a heart monitor for drone surveillance. Like that's the, how we have to take apart these stories. And one of the things that I started researching today was called, um, URI, um, like the United Religions Initiative that started in the late 90s. And I found it because on the press flower book of Ian Griggs plus press flower digital currency project, one of them was about the chaotic age, um, the age of the, yes, this C-H-A-O-R-D-I-C, -C, chaotic, chaos and order, which is Masonic. And it was developed, that concept, that book was written by D. Hawk and D. Hawk um, grew up, he was born in Ogden, Utah, and it's unclear if he was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but definitely in that region, and he became the head of Visa, and he was working on decentralized organizations, and he was one of the key people um, essentially setting up um, this, the charter of this United Religions Initiative. And again, mesh this with what I'm saying about Templeton, mesh it with Ian Griggs Digital Currency and Ricardian Contracts, and they wanted a, a global interfacing with um, cooperation circles and um, people of faith and ecumenical. And I think that it's all gonna be collecting data and in, in this decentralized system is kind of goes along with, um, you know, MasterCard and the digital identity and the UN. So this, this you know, you, um, United Religions Initiative um, came through the UN. And so it was, it was announced in 2000 in Pittsburgh, which is significant again, because that's Carnegie and Carnegie Mellon and the Mellon family and also the um, uh, P uh, Pitcairns, P Play Glass people. Like there's a lot going on in, in Pittsburgh and Alcoa and you know, the early nuclear power plant there. Um, so yeah, there's all of these moving parts and I, I'm not really articulating super well how they all fit together, but it is churches, overseeing behavior, telling you that it's about making beauty in the world and being in alignment with the UN, but it's not gonna be good. And moving us towards some sort of, you know, 
ascended master, you know, consciousness, but we didn't choose that. Like it's not our choice. And I think we can step out. Like, I think we can step out of this play if we can look at it and, and see what it is. If we, can, if we can go there and like go into the natural world and say like, I see how you're messing with us and it's not okay. You're not allowed to put the world on tokens. It didn't look work, it, you know, ask Alfie Cohn. It didn't work for children. It's not gonna work for you. Like this idea of social constructionist on the blockchain through swarm collective consciousness and Piaget and Mandelbrot and fractals. We're just not going to do that because instead we're gonna go to the garden and we're gonna commune with the crabs and the eagles and the walnuts. And we're gonna see what stories they tell us because we're all relatives and we're all here to do it, do right by the natural world. And we have a faith practice, we have a spirituality, we know what is sacred and it's none of that. It's none of your token nonsense. Um, and crypto skeptics, I see you. I see where you're taking us and we're not going. We can see through your story. We're going to tell a different story. And the different story does not involve any sort of tokenized participatory democracy or eco-smart villages on modular nuclear energy. Thank you very much. All right. So I'm just going to show you. This is where we're at. <laughs> it's it, just like the suburbs. It's mostly a parking deck. <laughs> There's a whole lot of parking deck. I picked a, a natural spot. I always try to find the nature spot. So I'm here. Definitely the corporate-y kind of thing. It's, it's very slopey here because it goes right down to the river. I don't know if you can see there's a, there's a road and just beyond that is a railroad tracks in the Schuylkill River. Um, and then, yeah, so the Templeton Foundation is in there somewhere in the building. And um, yeah, so we've got, uh, this is the, so I have two things. I have sort of the spiral and I have the heart. All right. And I think I'm going to, this is my, this is my piece of, uh, this is my nice uh, piece of wood that I'm going to take with me. I don't want to lose that. And, wait a minute. Okay. So we've got, we've got the heart here. And then, so we have the little, we have the crab. And he has a little piece of mica on there. We have the Osage orange with the shell. We have, oops, this got pushed, moved over. We have our, the saying with the sunflower from Deep D. Thank you, Deep D. And some Tithonia sunflowers beautiful sunflowers, some cypress pods, again, channeling that primary water at Bartram's Garden, um, some feathers to take our message on up to where it needs to go. Uh, now these are calendula seeds, and it's interesting because calendula is a healing plant, and it's also cal calendula relates to time. So time is, is one of the things we're dealing with. And then I do have a bit of a ginkgo leaf in there, which is sort of Again, a timely, very old, very ancient, prehistoric. And then we've got the spiral. So it starts in the middle. Here's the corn. The corn is not doing so great, but I, I, I cozied it up with some dandelions and, and the um, love in a puff. So this is like heirloom corn. And then we've got some shells and uh, this, this little bit. Let's see. This is the old pottery. That's pretty cool. And this um, horse chestnut and the, the beautiful heart that someone made me. Look at the handmade stuff is perfect. And we've got the three little crabs, right? Walk sideways out of the problem. You've got some armor. Be confident. You can do it. We've got our little three crabs. And I'm not sure what pod this is. It was by the river, but it's quite beautiful. It looks a bit like, it's not a lotus, but... And then... So we've got the rope. This is the rope that spins around in the spiral. It's spinning around, oh, sorry, spinning around in the spiral. And then I've got the marigolds, which again are sort of for the ancestors and the spiritual, the people looking out after for us from the beyond and very explosive with beautiful yellow and orange with that, the, the goldenrod the goldenrod was here by the parking area and also I got some uh, 
evergreens from where I parked my car. And it was interesting, I'm below this giant billboard sign, a uh, glowing digital billboard sign, and it has water rolling down it, which is interesting in terms of the water programming. And one of the ads on the sign, this billboard sign, it was for Coca-Cola, the real magic. That's what they said, Coca-Cola, the real magic. So we've got, got the double shells and you can just see that's clematis. I think a, a special kind of clematis, it's very fluffy and a wild grass. And that's, I think a magnolia pod. That one might've been actually from DC, from the LDS temple there. I think I might've gotten that there. So, you know, we've got the, all sorts of stuff. It's getting a little dark. Lichen, Artemisia, some nice Artemisia. And um, this is uh, sycamore bark. So this bark peels off of the London plane trees. But yeah, and then we've got the Psalm 33, right? The Lord's word is true and all his works are trustworthy. We don't need your darn synthetic biology. Thank you very much. We are trustworthy. So anyway, good night, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this visit. Bye, Templeton Foundation. Okay, I lied. <laughs> so I'm on my way back. You can tell it's getting dark already, but um, I just had to show you this. So this is the, um, that's the statue. You can see Mr. McGuire's statue and it says, the race is not always to the swift, but to those who keep on running, James McGuire. So it's quite a pose. And then, um, so, so this is the, we're on, like I walked up this long threshold and I walked around heading back to my car there so you can see the bulletin board or the billboard that said coke the real magic and then but behind me in this lobby which I couldn't see before because it was it was dark um, but now it's lit up look guys that's kind of intense right the the art that's in there it's it's hexagons and it looks like a paper wasp nest but it's sort of open at the top and it's not actually perfectly done because there's some odd bits, so it's not a perfect hexagon, but I just wanted to show show you this, and it's it's behind the, the statue. You can sort of see its position. It's, it's in alignment there in the main lobby. And so what I did, I don't know if you can see this here, I've got the, I left the two papers that I read, the Templeton Foundation and the Tokenomics. And I left it there with an Osage orange and some sweet grass and, and a, some cones and a rock to hold it down just so I don't know if anyone will notice that we were here and that we were troubling this story. But um, wow, that, that imagery of the, the hive, the hornet's nest and the runner, it's something to, something to look at guys. It's definitely something to look at. All right, bye.